Hi, and welcome to Author Uncut. I'm your host and author, Patrice Williams Marks. Today, I'll be reading Chapter 9 of my revenge thriller, Counterpunch. But first, if you enjoy my podcast, I'd be so grateful if you spread the word by leaving a rating and a review, especially on iTunes. Author Uncut can be found wherever you enjoy listening to your podcast. Here's a synopsis of Counterpunch. Everest was not the perfect mom, but what she was, was fierce. After her husband Anthony died at the hands of a drunk driver, it was up to her to raise their daughter Mo alone. Her love for Mo was both unmistakable and unshakable. But when Mo failed to return home from swim practice with not so much as a text, Everest knew something was wrong. Will Everest find Mo in time to save her life? Better still, what will she do to the scumbag that brutalized her daughter? Make him pay. Chapter 9, 5150 Mo is in hour 69 of a 72-hour involuntary hold at the psychiatric facility. She was being held against her will, although committed by her mother. Everest first brought Mo to an emergency room to make sure she didn't have any physical injuries before admitting her. Once the exam was done, she was brought up to the crisis stabilization unit. Mo was still humming while rocking back and forth with her knees drawn to her chin. Although difficult to do in such a state, a biopsychological interview was done with only her in the room. Everest joined in after the fact. The therapist asked a series of questions, digging to discover contributing factors to her current state of mind. When she continued to be non-responsive, Everest was asked the same questions regarding Mo's history. They asked if Mo had taken drugs, drank alcohol, or had any outstanding medical problems. They wanted to know if she had suicidal thoughts, had undergone anything traumatic recently, and so forth. Everest explained to the therapist that Mo was an assault survivor, giving vivid details on what had happened to her. She felt in order for Mo to receive the proper help, they had to know her entire story. Everest also spoke about the loss of Anthony and the impact it was having on Mo. The therapist assured Everest that she had done the right thing by bringing Mo there that night. Everest needed that, as she was finding it hard to forgive herself. As she left Mo in their capable hands, Everest started counting the hours until she was able to pick up her daughter. Mo was led out of the interview room and into a hospital bathroom, which doubled as a shower. A shower head to the right and a toilet to the left. She was asked by her therapist to strip down completely because they had to record all injuries, scars, and tattoos. Mo understood what was being asked of her, but did not want to comply. She shouted to her mom to come back while unsuccessfully shoving her way out of the bathroom. Orderlies rushed in to assist the therapist. One male orderly held her against the wall while the female orderly rolled up one of her sleeves and injected her humerus with medication. Mo's flailing subsided, allowing the therapist to continue with the process. The male orderly left the bathroom while the female orderly shut the door and remained with the therapist. Both worked in tandem to disrobe Mo and log her physical injuries, which were substantial. The therapist treated Mo with a gentle touch during this time in order to make the experience less stressful. The first 24 hours were a blur to Mo as she was put on multiple medications. She was issued a gown, robe, and slippers. That was it. Hours 25 through 40, Mo milled around in what they called a day room, but it felt more like a prison. It was crowded and had the look of a dorm, but with about 50 bunks. Most other patients were either sleeping, yelling at imaginary enemies, or walking along the walls of the room, too doped up to know where they were. 
No one but the staff wore actual shoes, as laces were not allowed. Neither were showers. Once the fog had lifted, Mo was placed on medicines which weren't as potent for less aggressive therapy. Even so, she didn't want to take them and tried to assert her rights of refusal. But she quickly learned that complying was the shortest route to getting the hell out of there. If she refused, they could simply extend her hold beyond the seventy-two hours. Mealtime consisted of sack lunches, even for breakfast. Her days were filled with constant sessions with therapists every couple of hours, while her nights were filled with simmering rage against her mother for sending her to a place like this. How could she do that to her? This place was filled with whack jobs. She was nothing like them. Mo was not allowed access to the phone nor a pen and paper to record her thoughts. This was the most difficult part of her stay. She had taken so much for granted before she ended up there. Now, simply using the bathroom without asking was forbidden. She needed a plan of action, something that would convince the therapist that she was no longer a danger to herself or others. She decided to bury her suicidal thoughts, to bury her seething rage for her mother, and paint on a face of compliance. Mo was also enraged that her father was not there for her. She was enraged at the man who violated her. She was enraged at her mother for not protecting her, but mostly. She was enraged at herself for not being smart enough to see through that monster's phony act of being lost. Nevertheless, Mo was determined to present herself in such a non-threatening way, hour after hour, so that they would release her unschedule. She simply had to play their game just a little bit longer. Ever struggled with what she had done to Mo. She told herself that it was for Mo's own good, and that protecting her daughter's sanity was number one. She glanced at her watch, nine hours and thirty-six minutes, before she was able to see Mo again and possibly check her out. She stepped out into the porch and admired the capsular rays that broke through the high clouds and illuminated the dust flecks floating in the air. It was a stunning scene to behold that took her mind off things for a brief moment in time. That's it. Join me next week for Chapter Ten. Counterpunch can be found on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Apple Books, Google Play, and Kobo. Want to leave me a voice message? Visit my Anchor FM page. The link is in the show notes, and click on the button that says Message to leave me one. I may just use your voicemail in a future podcast. Want to suggest a show episode or get in touch? Visit me at authoruncut dot com, or send me an email at mailbag at patricewilliamsmarks dot com. And finally, to join our email list, go to authoruncut dot com. Until next time, write on. <laughs>